You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. And welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Wednesday morning, we are talking about Protestant critiques of Catholicism, especially from figures like Paul Washer, John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, uh, who else do we have on here? Vody Bauckham. Um, these are all men that I learned tremendously from when I was Protestant. Um, and evidently somebody put together a clip of some of these guys and their comments on Catholicism. Um, in maybe a 15 minute video or something like that. I'll put a link to it in the description. But we are going to watch it together. I briefly had a chance to uh, watch it a few moments ago uh, because like I said it's it's not very long and um, I'd, I'd like to interact with it so let me share my screen I see y'all in the chat good morning okay enable audio here we go they start out with Bishop Robert Barron and some of his comments about justification from the Council of Trent and then they just move into um, Protestant critiques of Catholicism. Uh, I had to grab my phone there. Fell out of my pocket. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and begin. Please let me know, by the way, if my audio compared to the audio from the screen is too loud, not loud enough, if it's distorting when I play the video. Just, just let me know if y'all don't mind the uh, audio feedback since we're doing this live. Okay. I would say... Take the time to read the... Oh, that sounds really loud to me. That sounds really loud. Hold on. Let me... I can tell you right now. If it sounds bad on my end like that, it's probably loud for y'all. Um, Maybe cut it down here. Oof. Hold on. Man, that's still loud. Okay, let me maybe try this volume. Please, please let me know again uh, if this is better. Right, let me share my screen. Yeah, distorted. Right, I was, I was hearing it distorted. This sounds loud enough to me, but not really distorting. Let me know what it sounds like to y'all. I would say, take the time to read the Council of Trent, the documents. They really are extraordinary. The Council of Trent. The Council of Trent. The Council of Trent. God imputes, as it were, righteousness to us. See, Tr uh, Trent <laughs> balks at that. And of course, the Council of Trent is a Catholic council that responds to the Reformation, which is why they're mentioning it. Um, okay, let's continue. Luther had taught a version of total depravity. He also taught a version of forensic or imputed righteousness. That means we're not really made righteous by grace. We are declared righteous. God imputes, as it were, righteousness to us. See, Tr uh, Trent balks at that. The Catholic Church has always balked at that. Because we hold to a real transformation that, yes, we are, uh, compromised dramatically by sin. Yes, we need a savior. Can't save ourselves. But that grace, now having invaded our lives, can be cooperated with. So here's now what remains integral of human freedom and human intelligence and human goodwill can cooperate with grace so that the divine life can grow in us and become perfected in us. That's why Trent talks about justification, which happens through faith and grace alone, quite right. You can't do it on your own. Did you hear that? So Barron is acknowledging that there is a faith alone 
that we can speak about for justification. And as I've said many times, that's because he's referring to the initial moment whereby we're justified. So that initial moment where we're translated from the state of being under the old Adam to the new Adam, being under the devil to now being under Christ, that's completely unmerited. And we can speak about it as by grace alone and faith alone, as long as we understand faith here to mean a faith formed by charity, um, but it clearly does not merit anything for that. It does not merit that initial moment of justification. That's impossible. Um, which is half of the battle here, half of the discussion, half of the concerns that, or, that, that Protestants have about Catholicism. So in other words, that right there solves a lot of the dispute, but not all issues remaining um, while surrounding Catholicism and Protestantism are solved by that. There still are some remaining issues, but that's a huge one right there. Uh, but but notice that he acknowledges a grace and faith alone in that moment. But then it speaks of an increase in justification, which can happen through our cooperation. Right. So when we speak about merit, it's in reference to post initial moment of justification. So after being initially justified, we can then speak about being further justified. And then we can talk about us cooperating with grace in relation to that. Um, now that, of course, a Protestant is generally going to deny that. Um, but that's, I think, really where the debate is, not the initial moment of justification. We're all in agreement that nobody merits that. And in this we get, if you want, the Catholic difference. The difference, though, is the capacity to cooperate with the energy of grace so as to grow in justification. What I am going to say will surely offend those who are devout Catholics. It will surely offend those who believe that Catholics are brothers and sisters in Christ. Some will read it as unkind and unloving, but nothing is more loving than the truth. To let somebody perish in a false system isn't loving at all. To rescue people out of a damning and false religion is the only loving thing well, look, I, I agree that if Catholics are in a false religion and we're damned, then yes, it is a loving thing for Protestants to reach out to us and challenge us and call us away from that false religion. So, I mean, I, I'm in agreement there. I would just simply say that we're not in a false religion. And it, it's just ironic that um, people whose positions come much, much, much later than Catholicism and the apostolic church would speak about true christianity and then refer to actual historical christians as a false religion that's just what's incredible to me you'll notice people who take this position like macarthur are usually the ones who are deficient in knowledge of church church history macarthur is certainly deficient there as are the other individuals in this video um rc Sproul included they're generally deficient in their knowledge of church history. Their knowledge of church history at best goes back to the 16th century, at best. And they might have just a couple superficial um, bits of data that they're aware of prior to that. Just very, very basic stuff. And, and, and not even the complete basics, but just blips and bits and pieces of the basics. Um, so again, I, I don't think that anybody who is really, really aware of the, the um, historical aspects um, to church history could really maintain that position. Um, but OK, let, let's move forward to do. Well, I'll just go, ahead and go on record here. I, I, of course, I think the Catholic Church is apostate. The Roman Catholic Church is apostate. They preach a false gospel. They fit. So we're apostates because we preach a false gospel. Well. Um, okay. I mean, if, if we were to preach a false gospel, is, is that actually the definition of apostasy? First of all, apostasy is a total repudiation of the Christian religion. Um, if somebody teaches a false gospel, is that a total repudiation of the Christian religion? Maybe, maybe not. You know, I, I could still see somebody preaching a false gospel that, but maintaining other aspects of the Christian faith. But I guess, you know, if, at the end of the day, if if you have some serious heresies, the, your your affirmations of the you know rest of the Christian faith might not really 
um, be to much, much good to your good. So um, I, I could I could loosely accept this idea that, OK, if you preach a false gospel, you're apostate. But I, I do want to point out that that's not really the definition of apostasy. But I, I understand where he's coming from. So if if Catholics teach a false gospel, that's a serious problem, a very serious problem, because we would fall under the um, anathema and condemnation of, of Galatians that Paul mentions, right? Let them be anathema. Let them be accursed. Um, that would be pretty bad. Um, so yeah, if, if we preach a false gospel, I sure want Protestants to challenge us and correct us in, in truth and love. But I don't accept that. Um, and when you start to push back um, against this Protestant rhetoric and start to say, okay, how do you define the gospel? You then start to find very serious problems. They speak about a, a true gospel versus a false gospel. Um, but then determining what that true gospel is, is, is very, very difficult. And there's going to be many different variations of it among Protestants. Um, but more importantly, um, you start to ask, okay, well, how do you know that this is the true gospel and not just a distortion of the gospel? You start to get into problematic territory there. And most importantly, when you take their standard of what the true gospel is, no matter what it is, you won't be able to find that in church history. And that's my biggest concern is that we would have to effectively say, you know what, after the preaching of the New Testament, after the apostles, the church just went completely off track and abandoned the gospel. And that's pretty much the Mormon thesis and also the Gnostic claim to an extent. Um, not that Protestants are Mormons or Gnostics and all of their distinctives, clearly they aren't, but they do kind of share that. Uh, some of some Protestants sh would share that um uh, that perspective with the Mormons and Gnostics. Not all. Some Protestants will say, no, the church did not go astray after the time of the apostles and the gospel was there, and they'll try to substantiate the claim. But I've always found it wanting. Their understanding of justification, their understanding of the gospel message and, and its proclamation is not only not being proclaimed in church history, it's being entirely undermined by what is being proclaimed by Christians in church history. That, that's the problem. It's not only not there, what is there and what's there in an abundant fashion is completely contradictory to their understanding of the gospel. And that's my biggest critique of Protestantism is its lack of historicity. Um, we can talk about problems in church history and we can talk about inconsistencies and we can talk about um, developments and things like that all day long. But that's in a completely different realm then your you, the very core of your message is not only not present in church history it's contradicted by christians historically that's something else initially declared themselves to be a false church on uh, the council of trent right uh, false church well again how do you now identify what is a true church that's going to be the problem the ecclesiology of most of these protestants is incredibly deficient and it's ahistoric so when you it, it sounds nice oh yeah you know catholics completely abandoned the gospel at trent and they declared themselves a false church it sounds convincing until you start to press them okay well what, what constitutes a true church oh well a church that maintains the the gospel and the essential message of christianity okay well how do you determine what's essential versus what's heterodox versus what's not essential that's when you start to see the Protestant position, you know, unravel. And and ultimately it it ends up to being incredibly unconvincing. All right. Um right. when they declared anathema upon Paul's gospel, Jesus' gospel. Um Yeah, see, I mean, this kind of rhetoric, I hmm. I mean, if it were true, right, that that the Council of Trent anathematize the gospel of the new testament I, I suppose you would you would have to say these things right um out of truth and charity but i i find it to be just empty rhetoric um paul's gospel jesus's gospel being anathematized of absurd absurd um and if that's your position you're going to have to say that about quite a few church fathers they also anathematize the um gospel of paul and of jesus no um, Trent did not anathematize Paul or Jesus's gospel. They anathematized 
Jeff Durbin's understanding and interpretation of Paul and Jesus's gospel. Those are not the same. His interpretation and understanding of Paul and Jesus are not to be equated with Paul and Jesus's message. And that's the problem. Most certainly his view is 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 condemned. That that's that's definitely the case. Uh Jeff Durbin's view. Um but I don't accept this rhetoric that Paul or Jesus's gospel was condemned. And again, if you study justification in the first millennium, this is an untenable position. But again, people who promote this, like Jeff Durbin, are generally the people who are very deficient in their understanding of church history. Um, the best that I really have seen, maybe there's something else out there, but the best attempt that I've ever seen by a Protestant to try to substantiate the um, Protestant understanding of justification in church history was by Lingen, Ligon Duncan, um, who has his, his doctorate on, uh, what was it, Arnobius and uh, one of the other African um, early church fathers, I believe. Um, that's what he wrote his dissertation on. So uh, uh, some of the anti-Nicene fathers. Um, so he, he has some, you know, historical awareness, but when you listen to um, his exposition of some of the anti-Nicene fathers and their understanding of justification, the funny thing is he thinks that that promotes the Protestant understanding of justification, whereas a Catholic can affirm everything that those anti-Nicene fathers say and yet still maintain, maintain Trent. Why is that? Well, it's because what they're espousing is, is not the Protestant understanding. And Ligon Duncan's understanding also of Catholicism is deficient. Um, and I think Call the Communion did a really good job at reviewing that video many, many years ago. In fact, this when I was still Protestant, I was studying the question of justification in church history. And I, I saw that video from Ligon Duncan, and I thought, oh, wow, this is a really strong case. What is the Catholic response? I went and watched the Catholic response, where they break down bit by bit, piece by piece, everything Liga Duncan says in every one of the quotes by the church fathers and shows how it's not inconsistent with the Catholic perspective. And then I thought, hmm, okay. Well, I, I really need to find something that shows me the um, heart of the gospel, if you will, the true gospel. I really need to find that in, in the first millennium because if I can't find that, I mean, in my opinion, Protestantism is no longer an option. Um, so I pick up Thomas Oden, the justification reader, and, and many others who try to make this argument, and I find it wanting. Um, and that was only that was my assessment then. My assessment now is even more uh, severely critical of the Catholic perspective. And then I started finding things in Augustine, which I'll retail here in a moment, that was was deeply problematic for the um, Protestant position. And, and one, would have, one would then have to say that Augustine anathematizes and condemns the gospel of Paul and of Jesus. And if you're willing to go that far, okay, again, you've adopted the Mormon perspective here of, of a complete apostasy of the early church after the time of the New Testament. You might not agree with their other distinctives, but you at least agree with that one. And I would respond to you in the same way that Irenaeus responded to the Gnostics. Here's how we know the message that was proclaimed by Jesus and the apostles. Apostolic succession. Go to the churches that have apostolic succession. Listen, listen to their preaching. And that preaching testifies to what we present today. The so biblical there, gospel. The biblical gospel. <laughs> yeah. So there's, of course, the problem theologically, doctrinally. We can talk about Mary, uh, Mariolatry. We can talk about... Well, see, Mariolatry would be... Um, the idea that we worship Mary. And, and of course, that's that's absurd. We do not worship the Virgin Mary. Um, anybody who knows anything about the very basics of Catholicism knows that we make a very serious distinction there between worship versus um, honor. However, they may say, okay, well, that's a distinction without a difference, given that you pray to her and things like that. Okay, but prayer is not necessarily worship. That, that's the problem. You're, you're assuming that prayer is worship. And what we would say is worship ultimately is sacrifice. Sacrifice is ultimately worship, not prayer. Um, prayer could be related to worship, sure, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily the case, right? But this is why we don't offer any sacrifices to the saints or the Virgin Mary. 
that would be idolatry. So I, I reject this idea of Mariolatry. I think that's a caricature. About uh, Mary as co-mediatrix, co-redemptrix with... You know, co-mediatrix, co-redemptrix. I don't even like those terms. But um, if, if what we mean by that is that her fiat, her yes to the um, incarnation is the means by which God enters the world and undoes the no of Eve. You know, Eve says no to God, whereas the new Eve, the Virgin Mary, says yes to God, as, as just a martyr would, would aptly note. Um, and I think Irenaeus as well. Well, if, if that's how we understand covid tricks, sure, that, that's, that's not a problem. But if you think that Mary suffered on the cross for your sins or something like that, or as anywhere in the category of what Christ did for our sins, yeah, that's that's problematic. But that's, of course, not the Catholic position. Um, and, and that could be very, very well substantiated. So I would simply say the burden of proof is on you to show that um, these concepts in the Catholic tradition are um, not only um, foreign to the, the original message of the gospel, but also that are antithetical to it. With Christ, we could talk about prayers to the saints. We could talk mm -hmm. about purgatory, transubstantiation, all, all that, these different yeah. things, these unbiblical doctrines. But it's like, well, see, I would I would maintain purgatory, transubstantiation, intercession of the saints as all biblical um, doctrines. But then we have to ask the question: uh, What's the Bible, right? And how do we identify the canon of the Bible? That's going to be a huge problem, obviously, for Protestants. Whereas we're going to be able to identify the canon of the Bible because we're the very community that goes back in apostolic succession to the apostles. So we're, we're in a position to identify what was written to us. Um, whereas they, they are not in that position to authoritatively identify the canon. And in fact, like I've said, every argument that I've ever seen to substantiate the Old Testament canon for a Protestant, the Protestant version of the Old Testament canon, would exclude Esther. So I've never seen a convincing case to substantiate the um, Old Testament canon as understood by um, Protestants, let alone new, the New Testament canon, identifying it. Um, you might find a general consensus of, of some of the, you know, the Gospels and some of the books of the New Testament in the early church. But then that assumes that, you know, who's orthodox versus who's heterodox, because the Gnostics obviously would reject some of those proto-canonical books. So um, it begs the question, how do you know who is orthodox? Well, because they keep the, the message of the New Testament. OK, well, but isn't that what we're trying to determine? What's the New Testament? Right. So, OK. We're trying to determine what's the New Testament. Well, it's the ones that their Christians unanimously, or at least generally, um, concede is part of Scripture. Okay, but again, that assumes that I know who's Orthodox versus who's heterodox. That already assumes what you're trying to prove. Um, and then number two, there isn't a consensus on some books like Hebrews and Revelation until quite later. Um and by the time you do have that consensus, those are the same groups of Christians that also maintain the deuterocanonicals of the Old Testament. So it's like, upon what basis do you accept their New Testament canon but reject their Old Testament canon? Um, so, uh, again, it sounds nice. Oh, these are unbiblical doctrines until you ask two questions. How do you identify the canon? And then also, once you've established the canon, um, how do you properly interpret it? Oh, well, the rules of exegesis. Okay, I understand that. And that will get you pretty far down the field, the rules of exegesis. There's quite a few things that we, we can substantiate by just simply using the rules of exegesis. But the rules of exegesis aren't going to entirely get you uh, to where you want to go to establish what is essential doctrine and what is not. Because the rules of exegesis will not still tell you what, what the works of the law mean in, these, in, the, in the first millennium. Right. You're going to have to go outside of just internal rules being used for internal exegesis. And you're going to have to go to outside of the scripture and interpret it in light of history. Well, what did they mean by works of the law? What what was actually meant here in the first century? How how do I know what they understood to be justification um, historically? Let me go and see how the early Christian communities interpreted these passages. You start doing that, you've already lost. You've already lost as a Protestant because those people are going to testify against your understanding 
of the New Testament, not in favor of it. Grace alone. We don't like this. Nor do our Catholic friends. Listen to this. The Council of Trent. Session 6, Canon 9. If anyone says that by faith alone the sinner is justified so as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, let him be anathema. The wording of that one, let me pull up this wording here. Um, if anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining uh, the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his will, let him be anathema. Why is this a longer canon than the one that Vodi Bakum is using? Have you noticed that? This is a longer and more expanded canon. Why didn't he actually read the full canon? Why did he use that truncated version that actually misses the very purpose of the canon? The purpose of the canon is found in this version that I just read to you. It's not, it's missed. It's like glossed over in the version that he just read to us. And it's being used to condemn something that really Trent doesn't have in mind. What Trent has in mind here in Canon 9 of Session um, 6 is this idea that you could be justified by faith alone, meaning, meaning, what do we mean by faith alone? That your will does not consent to that. That it's against the consent of your will, if you will. Now, if you take that position, some Protestants do take that position, but if you take that position, okay, well, yeah, your, your perspective is condemned. But this isn't a blanket condemnation of all versions of faith alone. Because again, Benedict XVI, Robert, Bishop Robert Barron, and many others have acknowledged that, yes, there's an initial moment of justification. Um, we can't speak of a faith alone in that context. And, and this isn't excluding that. This canon is not excluding that. Um, what, it's, what it's excluding and condemning is the idea that I can be justified apart from the consent of my will. No, you, you, you consent to it. Is that works? Is that merit? Just merely consenting? Of course not. Of course not. Consent is not works. Consent is not merit. Um, so I, I'm very disturbed by that. I'm very disturbed by a... I, I don't know where he got that version of the um, of Canon Nine of the Council of Trent, but it's it's so deficient that it completely misses the point of the canon. And now he's using this to say that we've just condemned this idea that you don't merit that initial moment of justification. Um, no, we, we're not condemning that. We're not condemning that. We're, you you've completely missed us. So again, that, that was very concerning to me. Maybe he doesn't know better because he hasn't carefully read Trent. That's probably the case. But my thing is, don't go and critique a position that you're not really informed about. Again, session six, canon 11. If anyone says that men are justified either by the imputation of righteousness, of the righteousness of Christ alone, or by the remission by the imputation of the righteousness of Christ alone, meaning that you're not actually transformed when you're justified, um, that you're not actually transformed when you receive God's grace, the grace of justification, that you're, that you're just still unrighteous. If you think that is the gospel, you've lost. You've lost because you have people like Alistair McGrath who recognize this surely is not the view of the Greek fathers in the first millennium and the patristic era. It's not the view of Chrysostom. Chrysostom believes that the grace of justification is actually transformative. Not just merely extranos or alien or outside of us. It's actually transformative. So you now have to say, okay, well, if that's a false gospel, you now have to say the Greek fathers have a false gospel. And this isn't just the Greek fathers. It's also Augustine and the Western fathers. So now they have a false gospel too. So everybody committed apostasy? Where is your understanding of the gospel in the church fathers? It's just not there. This stuff works. This kind of rhetoric works for people who don't know church history. But for people who start digging, they find out, wait, um, 
If this is a false gospel, then these early Christians denied the gospel. Hmm. Is Christianity wrong? Is it, is Christianity falsified because of this? Hmm. I need to look into Catholicism. I need to look into orthodoxy. ...of sins alone to the exclusion of the grace and love that is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and is inherent in them, or even that the grace by which we are justified is only the favor of God, let him be anathema. Okay, and he says that as if that's a really big deal, right? I mean, he's just saying this like, man, we have anathematized the gospel. Again, what we're anathematizing is the view that when you're justified, it's completely alien to you. You're not transformed. It's not inherent. The grace of God is not poured forth in your heart and transforms you. Okay, well, if you say that, hey, that's an abandonment of the gospel, what do you do with the Western and Greek fathers? And again, this is noted by Alistair McGrath right here. Protestant scholar who surveys the views of church history, uh, of justification in church history. This is Dr. Barber commenting on, Dr. Michael Barber commenting on Alistair McGrath, who comments on Chrysostom, Greek father in, in the um, early church. Chrysostom's account affirms the declaration or manifestation of God's righteousness with its actualization and the transformation of the nature of humanity. And he goes on to say, um, this is actually a quote from Chrysostom. Chrysostom goes on to say, It is like the declaration of God's riches, not only in that God is rich, but also in that God makes others rich, or in the same way about the declaration of God's life, not only in that God is living, but also in that God makes the dead to live. And of the declaration of God's power, not only that in, in that God is powerful, but also that he makes the weak powerful. So the declaration of God's righteousness is not only that God is righteous, but also that God makes those who are corrupted by sin immediately righteous. From his homilies on, guess what? The book of Romans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Greek fathers read the book of Romans. They, they weren't just unaware of Romans and Galatians. They comment on it exegetically, verse by verse. And... Yeah, they don't come up with this Protestant understanding of justification. Here, they're backing up the Council of Trent's understanding. Why is that? Was Chris Ostom a heretic? Did he abandon the gospel? Did he anathematize the gospel? And, and the whole point of even bringing this up was to say, some people will say, well, you know, Augustine's view of justification is based on a false understanding from Latin rather than Greek. And whenever we got back to reading the Greek New Testament, we realized what justification means, and we saw where Augustine made his error. And yet, um, McGrath acknowledges that that's actually wrong. That's actually a flawed version of history because the Greek fathers affirm Augustine's understanding of justification. And they're not reading it in Latin. They're reading it in Greek. So you can't use that argument, right? It's a horrible argument because it's inconsistent with the data. What do we do with that? And it's not like Augustine and Chrysostom are anomalies. They're not. They're certainly not. Before we continue, I want to read something from Augustine here since we're talking about him. Let me stop sharing my screen, then I'll come back to it. Uh, let's see. This is from Augustine on Faith and Works. Ancient Christian writers. Augustine has a work called On Faith and Works. Did you know that? A lot of people don't know that. Well, let's see. I found this to be really interesting when I was a Protestant. Um. 
He says, when Paul says, therefore, that man is justified by faith and not by the observance of the law, he does not mean that good works are not necessary or that it is enough to receive and to profess the faith and no more. What he means, rather, and what he wants us to understand is that man can be justified by faith even though he has not previously perform performed any works of the law. For the works of the law are meritorious, not before, but after justification. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? The works of the law are meritorious, not before, but after justification. Isn't that the Catholic perspective? That initial moment of justification is unmerited, and yet we can then say after that initial moment of justification, we can merit further increases in justification. He goes on to say, St. James, moreover, is so opposed to those who think that faith can save without good works that he compares them to the devil. And then there's a note at the back of the book that the author makes that's really helpful in bringing out this distinction that I've been speaking about. He says this, At first sight, St. Paul and St. James seem to contradict each other in their teaching on justification. Paul says that man is justified by faith without the works of the law. St. James, man is justified by works and not by faith alone. But the two apostles are not speaking of the same things. These works which Paul has in mind are those preceding faith and justice. So before that initial moment of justification is what Paul has in mind. Those chiefly of the law, which is the object of his discussion with the Judaizers. The works of James are those which follow faith and justice. So after that initial moment of justification, since he is speaking to Christians already in possession of the supernatural life, the justice of which Paul speaks is first justice, i.e. passing from a state of sin to a state of holiness. The justice of James is second justice, otherwise known as the increase of justice, increasing justice. Increase in righteousness, which is what you heard Barron talk about, re referring to the Council of Trent. In short, Paul is thinking of man before justification, James after justification. The former has in mind a living faith, a faith activated by charity. The latter, a faith may be dead, a faith minus charity. A faith that may be dead, a faith minus charity. The one is speaking to the unbeliever, and he says to him that without faith he cannot be justified. The other speaks to the Christian, and he tells him that his conduct must harmonize with his faith, for faith alone is not enough to make him just. This is by a Catholic. Gregory Lombardo. How can a Catholic say this? Well, you know how, because he's affirming the Council of Trent that notes that this in initial moment of justification is something that's unmerited, but subsequent moments and increases in justification could be merited. So to when it condemns faith alone, again, it's not condemning all versions of faith alone. It's just condemning the idea that you could be justified apart from the consent of your will. That's all it's condemning. And, well, okay, if that's your position, then, yeah, you, your position's condemned by Trent. It is what it is. But I imagine there's quite a few Protestants out there that would not say, oh, well, my justification is apart from my will. I imagine there's quite a few that wouldn't agree with some other Protestants on that. Well, you might also want to check out Paul's works of the law in the perspective of the second century reception. This is by Matthew J. Thomas, who has been on my show and I interviewed him. So you should be able to find a video where I interview him about this book. But you can check this out because this is his doctoral dissertation. And it addresses in the first two centuries. Well, especially up until the end of Irenaeus, which is the end of the second century. What what what's what is this concept works of the law? How did how did the earliest Christians interpret and understand Paul when he spoke of works of the law? Very eye-opening. And of course, it, it it substantiates the Catholic position. Um, so maybe check that out if you want further reading on this issue. 
Um, because again, we have to interpret the New Testament in light of the community to whom the New Testament was entrusted and given and written. And that community did not understand justification in the way that Durbin and others are claiming. And, okay, so what do we do then? Do we just say that the gospel was abandoned immediately in the second century? If that's your position, okay, well, we have to take the argument elsewhere then. But I imagine most Protestants wouldn't want to adopt that position. Okay, so you're going to now have to account for the fact that you have a novel understanding of the gospel and you're saying that this is central to the entire faith. Okay, so that which was central to the entire faith was just unknown. And if you're going to claim it was known, back it up, show me. Well, Ligon Duncan tries to do it. And yet when you go to those fathers, everything they said is consistent with what we say. So that's those aren't sufficient witnesses. And the problem is you can go to those same witnesses and consider other things that they said that are against the, the Protestant understanding of justification. That weighs in favor of us then at that point. So it's not just a stalemate like you can interpret these fathers, Protestant or Catholic. No, because you go and read what else, you know, the other things they say. Um. And yeah, you, you can no longer say that these people maintain the understanding of the Protestant gospel. So that's my certain biggest concern here. And so let me flip it around and say, frankly, the gospel that these people are promoting is novel. It is another gospel. It does fall under the co uh, condemnation of Galatians. It is preaching another gospel. I know they do so sincerely. I know they, they, think that they're preaching the truth, but it is a gospel proclaimed in, in a different message than what was given to us by Paul. And it does fall under that condemnation of Galatians. We can just turn it right back on them and say, look, actually, that's your gospel, and we can back it up historically. So I, I need you to get in the game here in church history and show me where your perspective of justification is historical. Otherwise, um, you know, I, th I think history speaks for itself and shows that your position is, is false. All right, let's continue with the video. And finally, if anyone says that the guilt is remitted to every penitent sinner after the grace of justification has been received and that the debt of eternal punishment is so blotted out that there remains no debt of temporal punishment to be discharged either in this world or in the next in purgatory before the entrance to the kingdom of heaven can be opened, let him be anathema. And again, he, he says that with so much uh, passion as if that that's, again, a condemnation of the gospel. Well, certainly if we're talking about the initial moment of, of justification, like, you know, where, where we're baptized, um, that does remit temporal guilt. That does. So that's not what the canon is referring to, right? It, it would just refer to, in general, um, justification, such as um, justification after committing a mortal sin or something like that. Um, you do have temporal guilt that has to be accounted for. But temporal guilt is not the same, clearly, as eternal guilt. So the eternal guilt is, is wiped out. There is still, however, temporal guilt remaining. And that's a biblical concept that you see. I mean, David is again forgiven for his sins against, against Uriah and Bathsheba, but he still has that temporal guilt of his, his, child, being, uh, his child being killed. Um, so it's certainly a biblical concept. Um, does that mean the cross of Christ is deficient? No, no, because even, even us dealing with temporal guilt is only done at grace. Um, so <clears throat> I, I, I don't see how this is against the gospel or against anything in the New Testament. They do not preach the same gospel. Well, we don't preach the same gospel as Vodi Bakum. I would agree with that. We don't. Uh, Vodi Bakum does preach a different gospel, but I would say Vodi Bakum's gospel is not the gospel of St. Paul. Uh, Vodi Bakum's gospel would be, with all due respect, because I really admire Bakum, um, but with all due respect, it, it, his, his version of the gospel would be novel, it would be foreign to the New Testament, and therefore it would be one that falls under the condemnation of Paul. I know he's sincere, I know he means well, but again, people who maintain this perspective about the gospel are again the people who are deficient in church history, and I know Bakum, he's, he's deficient in his knowledge of church history. 
Um, so once again, when you when you can maintain this stuff when you're ignorant of church history. Um, it's a lot harder to to maintain this stuff when you become more aware of church history. And I think that there are thousands, perhaps millions of people within the Roman Catholic Church who really are trusting in Christ and Christ alone for their salvation, not trusting the way of salvation that their own church teaches. But the, the, the salvation that the Catholic Church teaches is what Augustine would have taught, for instance. And I know Sproul really admires Augustine. Um, it's also the same gospel that Aquinas taught. And I know he admires Aquinas. Were those people outside of the kingdom of God? Did they reject the gospel? It's inconsistent. And again, Sproul's view of church history, especially early church history, is also deficient. So um, it's it's frustrating listening to this stuff. You can only maintain this if you're ignorant. You can only do that. There's really no legitimate reason um, to maintain this if you're more formed in church history, other than some other factor that's now driving your perspective. So that's the happy inconsistency of our friends who, who are in Rome. But they have to understand, as I'll be talking about this afternoon, that Rome has categorically, consistently, and clearly denied the gospel. But again, I would have to ask, did Augustine and Aquinas do the same? At least be consistent and say yes. Stop using Augustine. Well, I mean, he's, he's passed away, uh, memory eternal. Um, but... I would say to people who follow in his line, stop using Augustine, stop using even Aquinas if you believe that they teach the false gospel. And no matter all other good things that they do, opposing abortion and affirming uh, the Trinity and all of that, the anathematizing of the gospel at the sixth session of the Council of Trent, which has never been rescinded and reaffirmed as recently as the Catholic Catechism, disqualifies Rome, in my opinion, as a valid church. And how do you identify a valid church? Oh, well, it's the one that preaches the essential doctrines. Okay, well, how do you identify essential doctrines? Oh, well, they're the ones that are um, representative of the message of the New Testament. Okay, well, how do you identify the New Testament? Oh, well, this is something that is testified to by the early Christians. Okay, well, how do you identify who's an early Christian and who's an early heretic? Oh, well, they're the ones who maintain the true gospel. Okay, well, how do you identify the true gospel? Well, they're the ones who affirm the teaching of the New Testament. Okay, well, how do you identify the teaching of the New Testament, what the New Testament is, and the proper interpretation of the New Testament? You see, we're just going in a circle at this point. We're just going in a circle. And so my response to them is the same response that Irenaeus gives to the Gnostics. You identify the New Testament and the canon, and you identify the truth of the New Testament's proclamation um, and, and how to know what's orthodox and how to know what's heterodox by those who have that authority in apostolic succession. I mean... It was a really good argument against the Gnostics. Otherwise, I don't know how you refute the Gnostics. I mean, the Gnostics claim to have the true message of Jesus. So uh, what do you do now? I mean, the Gnostics and Protestants are identical here. Obviously, there's differences elsewhere, right? I mean, Protestants are from a bodily resurrection, which generally a Gnostic wouldn't. Um, and Protestants would tend to affirm the goodness of matter, at least theoretically, whereas a Gnostic wouldn't. Um, okay, but... There, there might be a point of discontinuity there, but the Gnostic is going to make the same claim that they have the true message of the New Testament, and they're going to use a different New Testament, of course, but they have the true message of Christ and the apostles. All right. Prove it. Back it up. Well, they can't do it. They can't do it. Because the only real way to back it up is to go to that community that was established by Jesus and the apostles to go to that community. And that community persists unto today in apostolic succession. That was the argument that Irenaeus used in the second century to refute the Gnostics. And it's the same argument to refute the Protestants who have the same error as the Gnostics. Protestants here, in my opinion, are neo-Gnostics. They're just the new, new Gnostics on that point, not elsewhere, but on this point of identifying orthodoxy versus heterodoxy. True church versus false church. 
So again, it sounds nice. Oh, Trent, anathematize the gospel. They're not a valid church until you start pressing Sproul and others on, well, what is a valid church? What is the gospel? What is the New Testament? And I think it's an apostate body. And so with that in mind, I believe that every true Christian who really is trusting in Christ. True Christian? How do you define? How do you determine who's a true Christian? Trusting in Christ? We trust in Christ. So what do you mean by trusting in Christ? Well, the, the way that Paul spoke in the New Testament about trusting in Christ and just, okay, well, how was that interpreted by early Christians? Did they understand Paul in the way that you're saying? No. Well, did that does that mean they didn't trust in Christ? They anathematized the gospel? Christ has a moral obligation to leave that communion and to identify themselves with the church, not, not that it's a perfect church, I would say the the opposite. Any any Protestant who becomes aware of the false message of the their understanding of justification and other matters as well, when they become aware of those things, they do have a moral obligation to leave that communion and come into communion with the Catholic Church. That doesn't mean all Protestants are automatically damned. It does mean, however, once you become aware of the false gospel that you've you've adopted, you do need to leave. You do have that moral obligation and if and if you don't um there could be some culpability there right there, there there could be some uh judgment from god so i just turn it right back around and just say well same can be said about you right the same can be said about your communion and your community what do we do now how do we identify which one has the truth but a church that is a valid church a church that doesn't deny an essential truth of the Christian faith. How do you know what's essential versus what's not essential? I can answer that question with the argumentation that Irenaeus uses. I can't answer that question, and I've never seen them give a sufficient answer to this question from a Protestant perspective. Because again, it goes in that circular reasoning that I just mentioned earlier. And as long as the gospel is a, an essential truth of the Christian faith, you don't want to be in a communion that denies it. Uh, I have All right, we'll skip James White because I've already critiqued uh, White uh, tremendously, and he doesn't offer anything substantial there. So, them the truth, and eventually, usually pretty quick, they'll say, "Well, this contradicts everything I've been taught in the Catholic Church," and I will say, "I will not want to put my authority." against the authority of the Catholic Church, because neither one of us have authority. But see, that wasn't the view of Irenaeus, that wasn't the view of Augustine, and that wasn't the view of the Church Fathers. And if you're willing to throw them under the bus, okay, all right, at least you're consistent. But I, I don't know if he would be willing to do that. Maybe he would. I mean, Washer's really, really radical at some point. So, um, on some point. So, maybe he actually would throw the Church Fathers under the bus here. I, I, I don't know. Um, I've listened to numerous hours of Paul Washer. I used to be one of his biggest admirers and fans. I just loved his content. I thought it was excellent. I thought it was helpful. But um, I started noticing deficiencies in it. And so he and he doesn't talk much about church history and, and the early church fathers. So I'd really be curious. Would, would he say the same of them, that they don't have authority, uh, that the early church had no authority? The authority just ultimately is going to be the New Testament and the Old Testament, of course, so scripture. But again, brings us back to the same issue. How do I ident how do we identify the canon once we've established the canon? Can you give me an authoritative interpretation? Or is this ultimately your interpretation versus my interpretation and they're equal? And it just boils down to every man's conscience to determine for themselves a proper interpretation according to the rules of exegesis. Is is that really where we're at? If so, that's deficient because the rules of exegesis, at least internally, strictly applied, are not going to get us to certain uh, answers like what is the proper understanding of baptism, what is the proper understanding of justification. Um, nor would they even give us a New Testament or an Old Testament canon. I put the authority of the Catholic Church against the authority of Scripture, and, and I just keep going there. But this is what's... And, and again, he's having to assume what Scripture is apart from the Catholic Church, but 
again, the Catholic Church is the community that the scriptures were entrusted to. Um, clearly, according to the New Testament that he would affirm, that New Testament community was entrusted with the scriptures. I think he would have to admit that. Okay, so did that community immediately go astray as a whole? I, inquiring minds want to know. Scripture says, this is what scripture says, until eventually they will come out. But they. But see, we can do the same thing. I can say what scripture says all day long and say that it contradicts his message. And I can go to very the verses that he's using and account for them sufficiently with my perspective. Well, ask me questions. Well, do you think I have to come out? And when I, I say yes, and I say, and I will tell them if you truly belong to him, you will. And and again, if if Catholicism is false, we do need to leave the Catholic faith and, and embrace the truth. But um, it's a two way street. If Protestantism is false, you need to come out of that. You need to come out of that because you're in rebellion, you're in schism and you're also in heresy. OK. And so it 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 terrifies me. My mother really had to struggle with this issue. Um, when she was con when she was converted as a little girl, she immediately started attending a, a Baptist church. But all throughout her life, her relatives would um, would say, you know, would go to Catholic worship services and all kinds of things, and even seem to have some Christian virtue. And and she would always struggle with, well, can they be saved and be in there? Until and, one day she just came to a conclusion. No, this is an impossible. And sorry, looks like my camera is uh, overheating here. So I'll <laughs> fun, fun times. Uh, the the AC is trying really hard right now, but <laughs> but it is hot in here. But so I'll I'll turn my camera off for just a moment and and, and uh, let it rest and bring it back on here in a second. Possibility. Knowing what we know about the Catholic Church and what it truly teaches, and that's why she had so much conflict because she would tell them, "Come out." Come out. If you really belong to Jesus, come out. But those believers throughout those centuries, along with genuine and discerning believers today, understand this is a false system. It has a false priesthood. It has a false source of revelation, tradition in the magisterium. It has illegitimate power granted to it by this magisterium, this papal curia. It engages in idolatry by the worship of saints and the veneration of angels. It conducts an horrific exaltation. So I, I'm just curious. I mean, when he finds the papacy, when he finds veneration of the saints, veneration of relics and, and prayers to the saints in the early church, um, was this apostasy? Um, because these are these are often the same fathers who affirm Trinitarian Chalcedonianism. Uh, what do we do there? Hmm. ...of Mary above Christ and even God. It conducts a twisted sacrament of the Mass. Exalts Mary above Christ and even God. If any Catholic does that, they need to repent. Um, there might be some Catholics who, who do that, who are... Um, misinformed, but I would say that's no different than the Israelites who had the truth, but some of them were misinformed and did all kinds of bad things that they shouldn't have done. If any Catholic exalts Mary above Christ, stop, repent of that. That is idolatry. Um, but I'm not so sure that Catholics are actually doing that. I think more that he is misinterpreting things. Yes, by which Jesus is sacrificed again and again. So what it, this idea of sacrifice um, in, in the Eucharist, I mean, what does he do with the Didache, right? I mean, first century document that refers to the Eucharist as the sacrifice that Malachi prophesied about. And this idea of Eucharistic sacrifices over and over and over and over and over referred to in the early church and is taught explicitly by many fathers, Ambrose and Chrysostom and Augustine and all. I mean, did they maintain a twisted sacrament of the Mass? Okay, well, if, if you say yes, again, at least you're consistent. I'll give you that. At least you're consistent. But you're, you're now, in, in my opinion, in the same category as the Gnostics and the Mormons. You're in the same category, even though you're different. 
on some other points, you're in the same category. Again, it offers false forgiveness through the confessional. All right, so false forgiveness through the confessional. Well, uh, again, what do we do with this idea that the church has authority to um, bind and loose, which includes this idea that the church can remit sins? What, what do we do with that? What do we do with Jesus himself who affirms that, right? Jesus himself speaks about how um, you know, he, he breathed on the apostles and gave them the ability to forgive sins. And that authority is passed on to their successors um, historically. And again, early Christians testified to this, and they show that that church that the church has that authority to bind and loose the authority to forgive sins or not forgive sins if a person is impenitent. What do you do? I mean, do, do you again just say, "Look, they were maintaining a false gospel"? All right, if you want to say yes. At least you're consistent. But now you have a bigger problem, and that is you really have to say, look, the gospel was just abandoned after the New Testament, and we recovered it in the Reformation. If you can adopt that position, I really there's probably not a whole lot that I could really say to you. There, you know, you're you'll at that point believe anything. You'll believe anything that you want. But I think a person who's reasonable would have to say that doesn't make sense that the Holy Spirit would abandon his church um, and govern it so poorly that, you know, that, that the gospel is lost and, until the Reformation. Um, hmm. Let me maybe rethink that one. Right. <laughs> but but again, if you if you can believe that God would be so derelict um, to do that in the new covenant. And the Holy Spirit could be that um, they're like in his duties. Then again, there's probably nothing that I could say to you to convince you at that point. But again, I think that most reasonable people would say, yeah, I don't want to adopt that one. All right. So put up or shut up. Show me in the early church where they affirmed your views. They not only don't affirm your distinctions, they contradict them. That's the problem. That's the problem. So I challenge you, if you're a Protestant watching this, dig deeper into church history. Dig deeper. Actually, go and read the primary sources. Go and start reading the Church Fathers. You can start reading the Church Fathers set that you see there. It's available online, newadvent.org. Start start there. It's, it's not the only uh, resources available on the Church Fathers, but start there. Start with the Anti-Nicene Fathers. Start especially with the Apostolic Fathers, available online. These are the Church Fathers um, right after the New Testament. So the disciples of the apostles, people who actually knew the apostles, people who learned firsthand from the apostles or secondhand, um, who are in living memory, if you will, of the apostles. Go, go and read them and, and tell me what you find. Um, I think you'll be shocked. I really do. And, and that, that's why most people who end up going down that route of studying church history leave Protestantism. They either go Catholic or they go Orthodox. Uh, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Assyrian Church of the East, maybe in rare cases. Um, they usually go to one of those three, though, because they, they start realizing, OK, I need to be in a church that has apostolic succession. They might go to Anglicanism for a little while, thinking that Anglicans have apostolic succession. Um, so they might think that that's a good middle ground. They often don't remain there for very long because they start to see the problems with Anglicanism and its inconsistencies. Um, and then it's inadequate to account for the information and data in the first millennium. So they'll they'll they tend to if if they go to Anglicanism, it's it's temporary, and then they go to Catholicism or Orthodoxy. Um, that again, the vast majority of people who embark on that journey leave Protestantism because of this. Why is it? So I challenge you: start reading the Church Fathers yourself, and uh, let's see where you end up. All right. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this. Uh, let me know your thoughts there in the comment section. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. Also hit that like button. And also check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. If you want to support what I'm doing here. I mean, this is the way I um, provide for my family. So if you appreciate what you've seen here, I do ask that you would consider it. You also get access to um, extra content when you do that. And then... Also, visit MaximusInstitute.com to purchase the full course on the Magisterium that I'm currently offering. It teaches um, what the Magisterium is, how to identify it, its various levels, um, 
of, of, of teaching authority, its organs, levels of ascent, um, all kinds of really, really good stuff that is helpful in understanding the teaching authority of the Catholic Church. Um, its biblical roots, I'll also go over that. Um, why study the magisterium, why, why it's even important. So all kinds of really, really helpful lectures. And again, MaximusInstitute.com, you just click on the Understanding the Magisterium course and you can purchase it there. And, it, and once again, it, it also supports me and helps me uh, with, with what I'm doing if you purchase the course. So I'd really appreciate it and, and ask that you consider doing it. And if this course is successful, um, then I'll, I'll offer some additional courses, not only from myself, but also other lecturers. All right, y'all. See you later. God bless. Hey, RNT fans, just a quick word from our sponsor. Be sure to check out realestateforlife.org if you want to sell a home or buy a home and you want to use an agent who shares your perspective about the pro-life cause. Make sure to check them out, realestateforlife.org, to support the pro-life movement and your choice to sell or purchase a home. God bless.